My name is Khan Ross. I'm a former British diplomat. I resigned from the Foreign Office over the Iraq War. And since then, I set up an NGO dealing with uh, political causes for democratic countries and movements around the world. But since then, I've also had a journey where I've ended up as a believer in anarchism, uh, which is a rather strange thing for somebody who comes from my background, which is very much government, top-down authority, neoliberalism, to believe basically the opposite of that. The trigger was my resignation from the Foreign Office, or rather the Iraq War itself, because I worked on Iraq and WMD and weapons inspections. And to see my own colleagues, a government that I thought was basically good, naive as that may sound, lie about a war and ignore alternatives to war on something I really knew about, and so I knew exactly how it was lying, that was a real breach. Um, that led, opened the door to the journey that followed. Had that not happened, I don't think uh, what subsequently took place in terms of my own personal transformation would have, would have happened. It might have happened in other ways, I don't know, but that certainly was the case here. In the British system, there's no question that the Prime Minister is by far the most important actor in British government and therefore in British politics. To a remarkable degree, British government is centralised. Um, I worked in the Foreign Office, theoretically responsible for British foreign policy. The Foreign Secretary, in almost all cases, in almost all important areas of policy, deferred to Number 10 and was told very explicitly on decision after decision what to do by Number 10 and was basically presenting Number 10's policy. In, in those days, it was Tony Blair. I was also around when John Major was Prime Minister. So I saw both. And in Blair, it was actually worse. I mean, people in the Foreign Office said that Blair centralised government uh, more than any predecessor. So there were people who worked on foreign policy, including Alistair Campbell, who was technically their media guy, actually had a huge influence over foreign policy because Labour in those days very much saw the message as the policy, what you were saying about it publicly was really all that mattered. The idea that a small group of people can know the reality of millions or billions is absurd uh, that, and that therefore they can make the right decisions about those millions and billions is equally absurd. Um, and I think also you know, my own analysis started from a kind of empirical observation about what was going on you know, problems of epic magnitude, such as climate change and inequality resulting from the economic system that we all seem to have been um, uh, accepting, uh, these problems are not getting solved. So you look at the outputs from the system and you have to question the system itself. I mean, there are various theoretical explanations I could give you of why that's happened, um, including complexity theory, which I'm very attached to, which says that top-down authority can neither know the state of the system in any meaningful way and therefore kind of arbitrate it, and that stability can only come from combined bottom-up actions in a complex system. And there's no question that the Earth, the planet today, and human society, millions of actors, billions of actors in constant interaction, that is, by definition, complexity. The vast majority of political parties across the West continue to support this model uh, of neoliberalism, uh, supposedly representative democracy, kind of modulating the worst effects of neoliberalism, whether inequality or environmental destruction, when the evidence is overwhelming that that's not happening. And yet the vast majority of political parties across the West, and indeed to an extent across the world, still support that model. So the, the radical alternative, the better alternative, is invisible to a lot of people. That choice is not on the menu for them politically. Um, in Britain, it's a slightly different story because you do have a, a more radical political choice in the Labour Party that is offering a fundamentally different vision, and I think that's important, and I think that has shaken up the political debate here. We can talk about the programme that the Labour Party is proposing, um, but there is much more of a choice here. What I would like to see is real mainstream, comprehensive discussion of, of ideas like anarchism um, and the sorts of models of the company, of local democracy, of bottom-up democracy that it proposes, which are not complicated. They're simple things that actually people can start to impl implement 
already. They don't have to wait for an election to do it. I know there's a lot of optimism about the possibility of a Labour government. I don't dispute that optimism. It would undoubtedly be better, but I don't necessarily think they're going to bring about systemic change, which is largely social, actually. It's in our heads. It's about how we see each other, how we see society, and this is where anarchism, I think, has a lot to tell us, that if we follow certain principles in our lives and in our forms of organisation, including demo how we govern ourselves, how we organise our organise ourselves economically, those principles, above all being the rejection of coercion, equality of voice, equality of agency, then a different society will emerge. And I think that is plausible. I don't think that's a crazy idea. I think anarchism is actually, in a way, certainly says is a much more sensible, uh, rational way of organising society than the current system, which seems to me, when you look at it on the face of it, tiny numbers of people making decisions for this vast number, absolutely crazy. Politics and neoliberalism have created this sense of, of agency-less, of apathy is an impolite way of talking about it, that we can't do anything, we have to wait for them to do something. And in fact, anarchism very, very clearly says that, you know, if you're not prepared to do it yourself and practice these principles, then you're not changing anything. Communicating anarchism is complicated because it's got a history. Um, it comes, it's a word that comes with baggage in lots of societies. And interestingly, that baggage is different. And I've lived in the, in the US for a long time. And anarchism is definitely seen more negatively than it is in Europe. And that's partly because anarchists killed their presidents on one or two occasions. And, you know, I think that the left there, the Democrats, have got a long way to go in terms of understanding that their, their mainstream politics is, is just reaffirming a system. Um, whereas in Europe, I think there is more openness to, to the ideas. I, to, I think that the way to explain it is just talk about the practicalities of it and forget the labels. I mean, I would call it anarchist, but other people can call it communalism, they can call it self-organisation, they can call it bottom-up democracy. I'm not at all attached to what people talk about. And when you talk about the practical stuff, get away from the theology and the ph philosophy and the history, you talk about practical things like people sharing the enterprises that they work in, um, people governing themselves, taking decisions about the things that matter for them, whether the future of their local hospital or their local school, everybody gets that. That's not a complicated idea to understand whether you're from the right or the left. And I mean, ultimately, my hope is that if we do this, um, we will be able to dispense with political labels altogether because we'll start to see each other as people, not as Tories or Labour, um, Republicans or Democrats or, or whatever, or anarchists or socialists even. Um, I think, you know, that labelling has been very, very divisive in a lot of circumstances, clearly very divisive in the current political dispensation. I mean, there's a whole host of reasons for that in America and in Europe. But, you know, ultimately, a, a successful, cohesive society where all the vulnerable are taken care of, where everybody has an equal voice, is almost by definition a depoliticised society. It's one where human values and moral norms, in a sense, are much more important than policy or political parties. And I think where this, these ideas have been implemented, it's quite interesting. For instance, in Brazil, there was a big experiment, not really an experiment, practice of participatory democracy in a, a city called Porto Alegre, um, where millions of people took part in the decisions uh, of how to spend the city budget which was intrinsically better, led to much more equitable outcomes, uh, but also very interestingly led to a decline of party politics because people began to see each other as just people, you know, with needs. How, how do we educate our kids? How do we get treated when we're sick? Um, rather than as political enemies. But also the, the one of the reasons the political system is held up in, is supported and is perpetuated in Brazil like everywhere, is that it's a form of... Uh, small elites dividing up, dividing up the spoils. And there's always going to be com competition between those elites as who, who gets their hands on the money. And so in every country, you see that contest. And often that contest is presented as a bit about ideology or political ideas. In fact, it's just groups of people arguing over who, have, who, who has access to the moolah.